I'm a dude, and I'm inviting you to join me on a podcast about brews. Does that include stouts? Yes. Yes, of course it includes stouts. Like I was saying, join us every Saturday on the journey hey, hey, into... Hey, co- wait a minute. Do you, do you guys do anything about, like, IPAs? Yes. Stuff like that? Yes, of, yes, of, yes, we do IPAs. Okay. It's, okay. It, yes. Anyway... Join us on the Journey into Comics Network for Brews with Dudes. Whoa, whoa, hey, hey, hey do you, have you guys ever, do you care if I bring some Zima on? Yes, I care if you bring Zima. Zima doesn't count. Zima, oh. Zima's, Dr. Dongo. Anyway, join us every Saturday for a podcast that delves into the craft brew world. Following, following the following is a journey into comics. 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 Network. 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 Production. Production. Hey, hey, this is Josh Richmond, and you are listening to the Voice of Survival podcast, exclusively on the Journey into Comics Network. What's up, ladies and gentlemen? Welcome back to the Voice of Survival Podcast, Season 2, Episode 13. I am, as the introduction said, your host, Nate. Hope everybody is doing fantastic on this glorious Friday. I can't believe we're here. It's already Friday. Yesterday, you most likely celebrated the 4th of July. Uh, No, this episode is not about the 4th of July. Sorry. If they get your hopes up, I, I didn't. I didn't really mean to. Uh, you know, actually the plan for this episode changed because I had kind of wanted to go back to the religion thing a little bit and invite some people on to talk about it because I thought we had, I had really greased my mental wheel for wanting to have a deeper conversation for that kind of thing. And then there were some events that have happened that have been recently retold several times over on the Journey into Comics Network here uh, that happened in my life. And AP reached out to me and said, hey man, um, I don't know if this is a touchy subject right now, but are you going to cover death on The Boy Survival? Is that going to be one of your topics? And I was like, yeah. Like, with recent events, it is actually going to be a topic. So, <clears throat> you look at death, and you look at... You know, I think about my history with death all the way back to when I was a little kid, man. I remember the first time the concept of death got brought to my door, and I remember it. It's very like a, it's it's a it's an image that even if I couldn't necessarily like paint it for you exactly, I can give you a pretty good idea. So here's the setup: I'm three years old. My grandma Joby is watching me and my sister. She was just a little, little, she, you know, she was like a couple months old at that point, you know, maybe like five or six months. And I remember my dad and my mom coming back into the house and my dad was just weeping. And I was like, what is going on? This guy doesn't cry. I've never seen my dad do that. Something is wrong. Something's off. And, uh, all the way back then, I'll never forget this. This is something that when I got told then, it's just like burned into my head, and I've always been able to tell people exactly what happened. So my grandpa fought in World War II. He was one of the mechanics who were helping with the uh, tank. So if a tank broke down in the field, he was there. He would weld, fix, do whatever he had to do in the heat of battle or whatever. <clears throat> Boom. Get it up and running and go. Uh, he also had... Um, macular degeneration in his eyes and the macular degeneration in his eyes was literally like sped up exponentially because when he was welding in world war ii he was not using a mask he was just doing it you know which is fucking crazy so when he was over there he got an injury in his leg that lingered for decades 
And at some point, he injured his leg when he was older, and he got gangrene infection in his leg. And the doctors were like, bro, we have to amputate this. No questions. Like, we have to do this. By the way, you're definitely hearing fireworks happening. I'm recording this on the 4th of July, so you're going to get the, the whole experience as I'm hearing it. This is going to be really interesting to listen back to for sure. So my grandpa goes in for the surgery, and this was the the day that I um, I remember death for the first time. And he was supposed to get his leg amputated. He also had, because at that age you have to do these kind of things, he had a DNR. Your DNR, what's that mean, Nate? I don't have any idea. Do not resuscitate. That means if something were to happen in the surgery, this human person were to go into cardiac arrest and die. Don't bring them back. Let it happen. Just if they go, they go. Okay? So my grandpa has the DNR. They cut his leg off. In the process of doing this surgery, he has like a heart attack and dies. And they do not try to save him because he has the DNR. So they just let him die because that's what they had to do. And it was very unfortunate and very sad. Uh, my grandpa was only like 80 or 79 when he died. So he really could have probably went several more years, you know, several more years. Uh, and he was a very sharp dude, even at that age. And I remember him, you know, I remember getting yelled at by him for jumping up and down on the bed when I was like two and a half or whatnot. So <clears throat> I remember that the first, like that was the first death in my life that I vividly remember. You know, I remember the feeling of feeling what my parents were feeling and experiencing that emotion and and just being at the epicenter of it. And it's like the, the reality of death is no matter what. I don't care if it's this person's got cancer with six months to live. This tragic deed just happened yesterday. Uh, this is, you know, somebody who died heroically. Like any of those things or tragically, you know, like any of those things, it all sucks. Death and the end aren't a great um, feeling, obviously. As people, we want to hold on as tight as we can to the things we love because it makes us feel most alive. It makes us feel love. It also makes us feel safe. Having these people in your life, having the security of having whoever you have that's at your immediate family, you can't take them for granted. You know, it's, it's, it's very, it's very real that death can set you right. And I know that's a very bizarre thing, but you look at, so I'm, I'm trying to think about like, how would I tackle this episode? I just told you the first time I dealt with death and, um, you know, it, in stages, I feel death has treated me differently. And what I mean by that is, is like so, death has always been something I've been really just genuinely so terrified of. Like I'm so afraid of my own mortality and sometimes I put on this like I do live every day like it's my last, but you guys don't understand. I literally live every minute of my life as if like it could be it. And I'm trying to always just have a great experience while I'm here because who knows, right? It, it, it's it's crazy. So <clears throat> I think about like the different stages of death though. And it's like when I first – experienced death as a kid it was like a shocking thing like this person's gone now oh fuck man i was i didn't know that that's weird but then like as i started to get older and it happened a little bit more frequently and i would and it was weird because it was like my grandfather was the first major death that i remember okay but and i got some time with him which is cool it wasn't much but enough that i'm sitting here you know uh, 29 fucking years later, and I'm still talking about Furpo Phillips because he's the man, right? So my grandpa's name was Leroy Phillips. By the way, just a short side tangent, Leroy Phillips was a badass because he was in World War II. He was also a little bit batshit crazy. So he would go to bars, and if people fucking cross-eyed him, he'd beat the fuck out of him. And he was so good with his hands, and he was so quick on his feet, they called him Furp because there was a boxer in the Philippines, I think, that they called Louis, Louis Furpo or Louis Furpo. 
And uh, that's where my grandpa got his name because he was a fucking crazy badass, you know? And I feel like that's kind of that name. His name lived a lot in my dad. Like, my dad felt like he had to live up to that. So my dad was a, a, a really a, a fighter and had a lot of shitty experiences and fought a lot of people and got his ass kicked a lot, you know, and and uh, lived to tell another tale and whatnot. But I didn't ever aspire to be like that. So, anyways... I look at the stages of death from the first experiences to having, like, fringe family members pass away where, like, um, Maddie and Thurman were my aunt and uncle. They passed away, and Aunt Nellie. I really did have an Aunt Nellie. She passed away. Uncle Bill passed away. It was, like, all these people who I, I barely had time with, like, you know, maybe, like, two experiences, but when you're young, you really, they really stand out, you know? And those deaths, strikingly, no impact because they just stopped being there one day, right? And it was like people who you see once or twice, but them not being there doesn't change your overall experience. It doesn't really rock your bubble. And especially when it's older family members, when it's their time and, and you're you know in your late 80s and whatnot or however old you get to be, like it's, it's, if it's go-go time, it's go-go time, right? So, it wasn't until, it wasn't really until 2001, and I've told this story on The Voice of Survival where Tyler interviewed me, which was awesome, fucking shout out to him for doing such a great job, uh, but it was like, 2001 was really the epicenter of death, and I mean that because I was faced with it literally so much, I mean, in a calendar year for a 13-year-old boy who is extremely hormonal and trying to figure out who he's going to become and trying to find this identity that I didn't have, you know, and trying to have friends that I couldn't make and whatnot. Like, and I still had cool friends and whatnot, but this man made shit really strange. So 2001 started off, and the first thing that really happens that I remember that year is in February the 16th of that year, my grandma Kearney died. And she was an awesome lady. She had like two triple bypasses and then had pneumonia and it took her out, right? Awful. And it affected me. At 13, I was a little bit more emotional. I, f I felt more personally close to her. I can remember being in the car and the feeling of just like how weird I felt because death was in the air, you know, and it's this thing that nobody wants to talk about, but everybody's feeling it. Everybody kind of wants to talk about it, but no one knows how to like, just like face it and talk about it, you know, and be real about it. So uh, and, and another great reason why we're doing this little podcast here today is to just be real about death and talk about it. So she died and they had her funeral plan for that, like, next weekend. And no more is she... Okay, so, like, she passed away in the middle of the night on the 16th. So the 17th, I get the phone call. My mom called me, and as soon as she called me at, like, 7.30 in the morning, I was like, Grandma Kearney passed away. And she said, yeah, your grandma passed away last night in her sleep. And I was like, oh, man, that sucks. You know, and it was sad. It really was. And then the very next day, and this is not a liar joke, I was, and I still to this day, you can ask people, I'm a big NASCAR guy. I know that's weird. Most people don't know, but I have like this weird obsession with racing. I love going fast. I don't drive fast per se, but if I'm in an opportunity where I'm racing or or, or can can go fast legally, uh, I definitely take that opportunity. But I don't push it with like being out on the road and blowing past people at 90 miles an hour or some shit on the interstate because that's dangerous you can get people killed and i'm not all about that i cannot i cannot live through what other people lived through and i lived through uh because of other people so uh my grandma died and then like i said back to nascar love nascar huge nascar dude and i'm a big dale earnhardt guy honest to god Love the Intimidator. Always did. Was always rooting for him. Just got to see some of the coolest moments in that guy's career. Come at, like watching just him, uh, you know, when Daytona. I, all the things that happened in his career were just amazing. But like to see the the end of his career, right, was extra special. 
and I rem- and I will never forget this, man. I was watching the NASCAR race, and this is actually going to tie in. Man, this is so good. This is going to tie into the religion episode we just did uh, on J.I. or on Boys Survival here. Sorry, too many shows going on. My brain's overload. So uh, I'm watching this race. It's the Daytona 500 in 2001. It's February 18th. They're going around one of the final laps, and Sterling Martin clips Dale Earnhardt in the back uh, driver's side quarter panel and puts him in the wall fucking hard. Or actually, I think he, 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 I think he did clip him in the driver's side first, but then he ends up getting pushed back up the track. And in with this happening like crazy, uh, he wrecked so hard it killed him, essentially. He gave him a heart attack, and he died. And Dale Earnhardt died. Now, here's the crazy thing. He hits the wall, and as soon as he hit the wall, I was getting picked up to go to a fucking church thing, okay? And I literally looked at my dad, and I said, something's wrong. And my dad called me at the fucking church. I was in the kitchen, and the phone rang. And the, one of the ladies picked it up. She said, and, God, I, I, but she, Nathan, because that was who I was at that time. The phone's for you, okay? I walked over. It was my dad. He's like, hey, man, uh, I wanted to tell you before you saw it somewhere else, but Dale didn't make it, you know, like, he, he did die. I was like, oh, my God. And it was just like, okay, so my grandma just died. Dale Earnhardt died. This is starting to feel, like, weird. Why is death following me, right? So February happens. March, April, nothing. May, nothing. June, it's the day before Father's Day, and I told this story as well where my uncle got killed by a drunk driver, right? And again, it's it's 2001. So July, nothing happens. August, nothing happens. September 11th, 2001. I feel like that's an important date in history. Oh, because it is, because it changed my life, because it was this tragedy that, again, a 13-year-old boy watched happen to our country, okay? A country that at that time I felt was very much alive and had my best interest at heart and had everybody's best interest at heart. I was so blind to it, you know, honestly. And 2001 happened, and it it does touch home a little bit closer because even though it didn't personally happen to a member of my blood, my stepdad's family was actually affected by the attack. His cousin was in the North Tower uh, floor 105 and didn't make it and like called his fucking wife and shit it was super tragic and f- super they had just had a kid and like the like the fucking horror stories you hear about 9-11 of the people that like I can't believe somebody who had everything going for them passing away like that he was one of those guys so it's just like okay 2001 epicenter boom death 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 it's it's like I can't escape it Okay, and it's not even done yet. This is not even done yet. This is how the epicenter 2001 is affected. So October goes by, nothing really. November goes by, nothing really. December goes by, nothing really. Now we're technically on a 2001. It's 2002. It's January 2002. A kid I go to school with who I know who sits at my lunch table literally right across from me who we joke with every single day shoots himself in the fucking head at home. Because his dad screamed at him over bad grades. Blew his fucking head off. Super tragic, right? And it's death. It's more death. And this like 13 to 14 year old boy who is at the time into church, into religion, okay? Into all of this stuff is going, wait a minute. Whoa, whoa. Wait. <laughs> Hold on one second. Okay, well, if I, like, like, so many people have died this year that affected me personally. And and, and and then also a national tragedy of that level with so many casualties. So it's like, what the fuck? How is religion really a thing? Like, I thought your God was supposed to protect us and we're all supposed to be cool. Well, this isn't the right thing, you know? So, it, like, it, that's the, one of the turning points that made me definitely question my religious beliefs. It's all tied in death because death is what the what is the great revealer, you know? <clears throat> and I think some people, and I'm going to be honest... I think that some people who have led really bad lives, people who are bad people, okay, are the people that find God on their deathbed. Because they cannot accept 
that they were such a shitty person and they can't take it back now. You can't undo it. So you pray to your maker and you say, look, forgive me for being such a fucking awful shit. And, uh, you know, I don't, I'm, I'm grateful that that's not going to be me, man. Like I'm not, if I go out 97 years old or some shit, who knows you're listening to the archives now and it's like the year, you know, 2088 and I would have been 101 years old, but, uh, you know, luckily earth survived the great, uh, climate change disaster that almost cost our entire globe. But anyways, you guys are listening. Hopefully, uh, I did in fact live to be really old and I'm not going to be on my deathbed going, oh man, I wish I wasn't a bad person. I wish I would have done things different. I need to repent and say I'm sorry because it's going to make me feel better when I cross over or whatever, you know? I think that's silly, you know? Honestly, if you're already a religious person, I understand using that when you're when you're at your end. Like That's honestly kind of beautiful because it's, it's what your belief was, what you um, bought into for your existence. And it's your comfort to go, quote unquote, home into the great unknown. And who knows, man, we could die. And and I've said this a hundred million times, but this is at a scientific level. Okay, you look at this and this is why the topic of death is so interesting and it's so worth talking about. Right. Because you can look at it from more than just tragedies, because I think all death is tragedy. That's just it, it comes hand in hand. There's never a death that's like. Oh, that was sweet. That was a good one. That was a great death. Like, it never happens like that. It's never that. So, for me, you know, you look at, and the the great question is this, it's like, we're all energy, okay? It is factual. You look at it from a scientific level, every single thing that is in existence at some level is energy, pure harnessed energy, okay? Living beings have energy pure energy running in them. That's what we are. We are this, you know, amalgamation of muscle mass and uh, nerves and bones and skin and a brain and a spot, you know, and the whole bits, right? But the question is, according to science, if I create energy, there's no point. There's no, I mean, the energy that's flowing through this board right now as I record This podcast is energy that's been used a million times in a million other things because energy is never destroyed, okay? So if that's the case, when we quote-unquote die, when our conscience, when our conscious self shuts off from the world, okay, and we can no longer verbally communicate, and we can, you know, and and all life functions are quote-unquote ceased, the energy has to go somewhere. It doesn't just peter out. It doesn't just fade, right? So what's the point? It's like maybe, you know, and this is maybe some crazy conspiracy or whatever, but who knows? Maybe this is just a phase, and this is just a part of, like, like being in the womb is just a phase of life. You're in the womb for a bit. So then the, the next phase, we do not experience it in this form but when we get there, we're going to, and it's not going to be what you think. It's not going to be this heaven thing where everybody's in fucking togas and has fucking gold halos on their brains. It's not going to be anything like that. I think there's going to be like, if anything, it could be like a civilization, some sort of advanced civilization that's found a way to harness energy and our life experience builds energy points and it is utilized in the next form. And how we live is utilized in our next part of this journey. Because I don't think it's going to ever end. I think we're all going to have experience forever. But we're not always going to be humans. We're not always going to be able to talk to each other. You know, I think that's why communication is a great gift. So, you know, looking at death, man, it's like... So the 2001 is like also the death of my religion, right? Because it really starts to affirm to me that I do not want to participate in organized religion anymore because it's failed me. I looked up to this God at the time and I was like, why, man? Why? Why would you do this to me? And I, of course I took it personal. 
All these events were affecting me, and it was affecting other people, obviously. All these deaths, my grandma's death didn't just affect me, it affected other people. Dale Earnhardt's death affected other people, affected me. And affected me in different ways, okay? But you keep going down that list of the people that died that year and everything, and it's just like, something's off. So, the death of my religion kind of saved me. And that's crazy to talk about, because I feel... I feel, honestly, I probably would have a very dark fate if I would have stayed wrapped up in religion. I think it would have consumed me. I think I would have lost myself to something that isn't who I actually am. Obviously, I'm, I've am i I've made the clear decision to be this me. And uh, religion, man, my eyes were opened even further a couple years later in 2003 when I was dating Lindsay, and I talked about that on the podcast, the religion podcast. So, um, yeah, it, it's like the epicenter, and it's weird, and I'm really grateful, but personally, I've not had one of those years since. Nothing to that magnitude. Yeah, I've suffered deaths, lots of deaths. I've lost a lot of great people since 2001. My grandma Phillips has died, and my uncle Brent died, and my uncle Ron died, and, you know, I mean, man, it's just, it, it's just, uh, you move on, and you have to find solace, and it's interesting, and I want to bring this up, because I was so recently in a situation where I was facing death, I thought, you know what, as weird as this is going to sound, I kind of thought, I'm going to kind of put myself under the mic microscope here and really study death and how it affects me as a person and what I went through and mentally how I handled it. And, you know, at first, you don't want to accept it, right? Denial is the is definitely the first step. And, and it's not, and it's not wrapped up in like, Oh, it didn't happen. That 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 did not happen. Because clearly you know that this person or in my situation, my, my cat Cammy, like you know that they're gone. And like my denial was so bad, I almost went to the backyard and dug her up just to see and make sure that what had happened had actually fucking happened. Because I couldn't even, I couldn't even fathom it, right? And... You know, you, people talk about the stage of anger. I never had that stage in this healing process, right? It was denial, and then it was the sadness, and I cried a lot, and little things would make me sad, and I would just visualize moments that I had just lived, and they were fresh traumas, and it just it broke me. And then, you know, at some point I learned that I could accept everything. And, and, and it was, you know, obviously, uh, it was only like a couple weeks at this point. But the, the thing is, is that I thought there was a version of me that could never heal from this. So to be able to look at it and go, well, okay, I just, I lived it. I just, I literally, I didn't, um, get lost in the whys because the whys you'll never answer. Like if, if someone's clock goes, don't ask why, because you will be left unsatisfied for your existence because you're not going to get that answer. And I mean, even, even if you were to get a solidified answer, like why it was cancer, fuck, it's not going to be helpful. It's not going to make you feel better, man. It's just, you have to recognize that it, we're all on that journey, you know, and don't let someone else's end drive you to your end. Some people get lost in it. They get lost in the shuffle of death and they go, oh, my God, my my uh, cousin or my brother or whoever it was meant so much to me. And and this person did it. So I'm going to be vengeful and, and go after them and have this like vendetta and they get their selves killed in the process or something and it's like that does no good because now you've just hurt even more people which is the thing that you're suffering from so you're causing the thing you want to stop ha from happening by 
stopping the person who caused the thing to happen. It's like, it's a never ending cycle. You just literally are just putting some sort of different version of that same energy out into the fucking pantheon of the existence and just hoping that it resonates with you. But honestly, man, death is difficult to deal with. It's not easy. Some people do suffer longer because of situations, man, and traumas, you know? I mean, there's a guy I know. I'm not going to bring up his name, and that's not because I don't love him. I do. I just I don't want anything to be misrepresented, right? It's his story. It's not mine. But this guy was driving with his girlfriend or his friend, his friend who was a lady. I don't know if they were dating. I can't be so presumptuous, but he was driving with this girl who was his friend who was about like five or six years younger than him at the time. She was 22. He was like 29, something like that. She had a fucking heart attack and died. Rolled the car. Should have killed him. They airlifted him and he was fine. Little sore. Banged up and bruised up. This is the second car accident this dude survived. But see now. He lives with the trauma. Of being in that vehicle. And experiencing those moments. And obviously the human brain is a magical thing. And sometimes when a trauma happens. It has a way of erasing it. So if you don't know how to retrospectively look at the situation or if you can't because you were knocked the fuck out depending on depending on the situation you know sometimes you just your brain says I don't want you to remember that and then of course other times when you don't want your brain to remember that it does and that ad leads into our next part of this show and that's a great segue that we get on our scooter and ride because PTSD is a real thing. Post-traumatic stress disorder, right? What does that mean? So, experience A. My buddy who was in the accident. He's in a car now. And somebody goes, oh man, my chest is hurting. His fucking head has to immediately go to, oh my god, don't fucking wreck. And and that's a trigger. And his anxiety's got to go up. And his mind starts racing with dark thoughts that he can't escape. And it's not that he wants those thoughts there. It's not that he even thinks about those thoughts. They literally rush in like black ink spilling onto paper. And there's no control. You can't, you can't escape it. And there's there's just too much. It's too much. To just, you can't put the ink back in the bottle. It's, it's out already, right? So that happens all the time with people and traumas, right? And, you know, I have been fortunate to have very few and far between in that regard of family traumas um, and major deaths that have happened due to trauma, and I hope to avoid that for the rest of my existence, but it's inevitable, right? I mean, the odds. It's just the odds. That's the fucked up thing. That's the most fucked up thing, is that we are all on this plane, and we are all on odds right now. Right now, the universe's numbers are rolling every second. Ding, 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 ding. And numbers are being punched every second. And every second that a number is punched out, a new life is born. And the circle of life keeps on, right? And maybe that energy does recycle. Maybe it doesn't. Maybe it does. Maybe it doesn't. Maybe it does. Maybe it doesn't. Who knows? So you have to think about people who have suffered traumas and them being triggered by things. And I think that the 4th of July is a great thing to talk about because it's literally is supposed to be a holiday celebrating our freedom, which is people that have fought for our freedoms in multiple wars, World War One, Revolutionary War, Civil War, World War Two. I'm not doing these in order, obviously. Don't look to me. Uh, Vietnam War, which was kind of pointless. Korean War, pointless. Uh, Cold War wasn't really a war, but we'll get there, you know. Uh, Desert Storm, you know, war in Iraq, war in Afghanistan, stuff like that. You know, it was supposed to celebrate, but the problem is now there's so many people that have been to war that the fireworks are actually a trigger. It actually causes people to panic because they're hearing noises that remind them of what it was actually like to be in war, which in and of itself is a giant fucking trauma to a human person. Okay, hi, you've been created. 
And just like in the movies, you've now been selected to go overseas. And you're going to fight for your country, son. And you might not make it back. Actually, odds are you won't make it back. You're on the front line. Good luck. And that, and that's really happened, you know? So the people that do survive that trauma, that were told they weren't going to survive, they do survive. They see their friends tragically die in some sort of terrible accident or something of that nature. And you know what happens? They come home and they hear fucking fireworks. And of course they're fucking losing their minds, man. It's all crazy. It's all bizarre to me how this all works. And that just goes into the next thing, really, because when I started this, we were talking about the 4th of July. It's like the celebration of America and and fireworks and whatnot. I was talking about how in 2001 I felt so alive, you know. But uh, and and, and in dealing with death, I was also a very patriotic person because of what had happened on 9-11. So... I look at where we are now, 18 years later from 2001, and the deaths and tragedies I've suffered and the losses and and friendships lost and rebuilt and regained and and all kinds of things. And I just go, okay, what, what has changed? And in America, everything changed. 9-11 happened and we seemed so unified, you guys. There was a time, man... Where it was like your fucking fellow neighbor was your best dude, and you could just, you just felt the camaraderie everywhere you went. You were proud to be on this country, uh, and proud to have survived that tragedy that was nine eleven. But then now you look at it, and you're like, okay, it's twenty nineteen. We have a kind of psychopath in office. We have all this stuff that's going quote unquote wrong. I, uh, well, is America still America even? It's like, no, because there's so many things right now that people, you can honestly look at and you can see flashes of history coming back. You want to talk about World War II where my grandpa fought, FERP, where he lost his eyesight, you know, um, he fought Nazis and they exist in our world today, you know, and that's real. And they want death to happen to anybody who is not like them. The problem is, them is entitled. The idea of them is entitled, right? And I say that because, literally, I want you to follow me here on this. They think that they are pure. We are All, every single race, every single person, every, I don't care who you are. I don't care if your skin is pure white. You're a mongrel. All the blood's been mixed. We've all, everybody's fucked everybody. Not really, but you know what I'm saying. Everybody in the, in the world has bred across and created versions and alterations and slight shifts and variations in each other and, that happened long before America even stood, you know. There were there were different classes being built up. And we're all intermingled. So, you know, don't think that you're some pure-blooded something or other because I guarantee you're not. And that's one thing that's kind of awesome is to see people that get mad because their 23 and me comes back and they're, like, revealed that they've got, like, African in them or... Uh, uh, some other, like, uh, Iranian, you know, and they're like, wait, what, Pakistani? How am I Pakistani? I don't, I'm, I'm in Middle Eastern. It's like, well, you know what, though? Your cousin Muhammad definitely, definitely way back when was with some lady, and that lady carries your blood, and here you are, man, because it's just sending blood further down the line, you know, further versions of the blood, keeping it pumping, keeping it going. So, you know, I just, uh, I think that if I were to give you guys some advice, and you're, you maybe you're sitting here today, and you're driving in your car, or whatever you're doing, you're like, man, it's weird, he did this podcast today, I've suffered this great tragedy recently, or this death, I hope he gives me some advice on how to get through it. And honestly, here's the truth, distract yourself, and distract yourself fearlessly. If you're going to cry, you're going to cry. Let it happen, be okay with it. 
say, oh, that's that's organic. I can handle it. I can deal with it. It's not the end of the world, okay? You literally just go, okay, 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 cool. I'm going to go out and play baseball. I don't usually play baseball, but I'm going to go do it because I'm going to get my mind off whatever's going on. Cool, great. Or I'm going to drive go-karts or I'm going to do a podcast. You know what? Honestly, I would encourage you to do a podcast, and I would encourage you to be honest with yourself on that show. I would encourage you to be honest and just say what you're feeling. If you feel like you have uh, you know, the tears coming down and, and, and you're afraid you're going to cry on air or something, which is, I understand that, man. You don't want to be crying. I get it. But, like, listen, if you're honest with yourself on the podcast and you, and you talk through and work through what your experience was, once it's out of you and you've actually verbalized it in a way that's for other people to ingest, it actually feels better and it feels freeing, you know, and, and healing even, you know. I mean, there's a lot of people that are suffering all the time that you don't even know. There are people, I guarantee you right now, there are people who are on my network and I try to be kind, and I'm, and I hopefully I am. I try to be kind to every single one of the people on our network, and I try to give them love and positive energy and say nice things all the time because I mean it. But I want them to just know that I am always thinking about them because there could be one of them, any one of them, that's suffering mentally with trauma or death or something that's really bothering them, and uh, it's okay to use a. Uh, a place where you verbalize your grief and the things you're suffering from because it helps you to feel release. I really believe that. So if you have the opportunity to do it, I do suggest you sit down with a podcast or something and just get your heart out there if you're if you're feeling some some bad stuff, you know. You know, maybe you went through a really, really bad death, or maybe death is a metaphor because death isn't always actual dying. Because death is is also the end, ending, things ending and being over, you know, the stop point, the game over, we're done here, you know. It's like The Walking Dead ended unexpectedly, but it was beautiful. Absolutely beautiful. One of the best, maybe the best story ever told in the history of our humankind. I can honestly say that. Just the ability to build characters and story and keep you interested and then have a twist and be so grandiose in the end in such a way and end so powerfully, you know. And uh, I'll be talking about more about this on Journey to Comics 251 that Tyler and I will be doing. Uh, but you know what? <clears throat> Death, like I said, could be the end of things. It could be the end of podcasts, which this one is going to be coming to an end soon. Not permanently, but uh, we are nearing the end of this season. Uh, Tyler and I have discussed he wants to do a couple specials uh, essentially through the show. And I told him, I was like, you know what, man? That's absolutely awesome. Let's do it. He's got some guests he wants to bring on. He wants to do a special with me where we're just bantering stories from our lives, which would be really interesting. And... With that being said, there's also a new beginning happening, and we're going to further explain that here as I build into the next week. Because next Friday, in place of what was Crucial Tunes time slot, or release slot, my fault, uh, there is a new show debuting on the Journey into Comics Network called The OGs. Featuring myself, Nate Phillips, the Podfather, and returning to our network for the first time in over a year officially as a member again, which I'm so stoked to have him back under the banner and uh, part of our family. Uh, we've long missed him. We can officially say welcome back. Brando, who's going to be joining me for a show that is going to be the original voices of Journey into Comics. Not talking about comic books. Not talking about anything but what we want to talk about, being topical, talking about life, having a show that's totally different from shows we've done before together. 
And I look forward to you guys hearing it. Episode 1 has already been recorded in the bag, and it was absolutely fun. Oh, man, I got a case of the yawns here at the end of the episode. See, I'm being honest with you guys. I didn't have to tell you I had a yawn. I could have edited that silence out or whatever. Maybe I did. Maybe right now you're like, wait, there was no there was no yawn. I didn't hear a yawn. That's crazy. Did he yawn? Man, my ears deceived me. I assured you. In real time, I yawned. But I'm not yawning anymore, folks. Uh, you know, speaking of death, I think this is the death of this episode. As we are wrapping up here, folks, we've talked a lot about it. You know, we've dove in, we've talked about some traumas that I've been through, and it felt really nice to get those out there and discuss them. And I'm really sorry. Hopefully, I didn't bum you out today. Know that this was said with love. There was no sadness in this podcast. I'm very analytical when I talk about this kind of stuff. Um, and I think that sometimes you have to be, you have to just recognize and accept the truth, which is we are all temporary, and none of this is permanent, and none of this thing that is life is is forever and we can't hold on to anything you know even if you hold on to things you can't permanently hold on to anything because it's all fleeting and even sadness is fleeting though that's the beauty of it and uh, let that be what you go out on today folks as always you can check out the voice survival podcast right here on the journey into comics network at journey into com every other friday get us on itunes podbean stitcher radio google play music spotify cast box tune in and many others, just search Journey into Comics Network, and you can get all the shows on our feed. Also, go to patreon.com backslash journey into comics. Give us a buck for early access and or exclusive content, and or give us more money for whatever you want us to have it for, and we'll uh, try to utilize it for some cool new stuff for you guys. I want to thank you all so very much for tuning into this very special very, very dark episode of The Voice of Survival. I'm sure we're going to do a deeper dive on death at some point, but that's going to do it this week for The Voice of Survival. I have been your host, Nate, and this is The Voice of Survival, signing out. <laughs>